Hello, hello, hello. Wave at me. Good, good to see you all. That was, that was a nice royal wave. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, DNA two weeks ago. In fact, who, who, who is, uh, who's here who it's your first time at DNA? I'm not going to embarrass you. Brilliant. It is so uh, good to have you here. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but Andy spoke brilliantly two weeks ago on Grace. It was, it was really fantastic. And I think uh, lots of you have been making use of the devotionals. Um, so I hope you're enjoying those either on the app, if you eventually found City Church hidden somewhere in technology, or, or on our website. Um, and, and I guess some of you will have been following along as well in your connect groups last week. So I hope uh, you've really been enjoying that. Let me just remind you why we're doing this. This DNA series is all about the values and beliefs that shape us as a church. Think about your Christmas traditions when you were growing up and maybe the order of things that you did during the day, like, for example, well, my priority, like when you're allowed to open presents, you know, the most important. No, that's not the most important part of Christmas Day, is it? Um, but, um, you know, you will have done things in a certain way, and that may not have ever been talked about, but it, it was a certain way, and that's then your expectation. Well, this is how you do Christmas Day, because that's how you did it when you were young. And then you actually find, oh, this, people do it in different ways. Um, but that, was, that definite way was like the normal for you. And then the way we do all things in life, they become ingrained. They become habits or patterns of behavior. They're a little bit like, you know, the ruts in, in a path or in a field that are made by a tractor or some other vehicle that always goes a certain way. Or when, uh, you know, people walk to work and they cut across a bit of grass and then gradually it just becomes a path, doesn't it? And, and like the values and beliefs uh, that we hold, they just become ingrained. Now, some of those can be really good and some can be not so healthy. And so we want to be really clear about what are the biblical values and beliefs that we hold dear, and kind of state those clearly. Um, I'm delighted to say that later in the series, we have Guy Miller, who leads our commissioned family of churches, is going to be coming and speaking. That's on the 9th of March. Um, and we've also, just to let you know, we've had to rejig the order slightly of what we're doing. So it's there in, in red or pink, depending on... Uh, your color coding. Um, uh, we're at Ebenezer Church on Filton Ab Avenue next time. Um, are we going to do prizes? Like for anyone that turns up here in two weeks time? Andy will think of a prize. Um, it's probably going to be a random thing from a supermarket knowing Andy. Um, uh, like a tin of anchovies or something. That would be nice. Um, so we're at Ebenezer uh, in two weeks' time, and James Lee is going to be speaking about the Word of God. Nice small subject. Um, and, and there we go on through. So Guy's with us on the 9th of March. Now, tonight we're talking about team. And you might think, team, that's a slightly strange choice for, uh, as one of our key values that we hold. Why, why are we picking that one out? Why is that important? We believe, oh, sorry, have I, I've moved. Um, we believe that team is critical to who we are and how we do things. Let me give you a little bit of background to that. Ever since the Enlightenment, this is, this is my slightly intelligent paragraph, okay? So if you're, like, not interested in your, you know, it's my Pete Walker paragraph, if, if you know Pete. Um, uh, ever since the Enlightenment in the UK, our society has become increasingly individualistic. Yeah? So prior to the Industrial Revolution, which I think that was, I'm not a historian, 18th century-ish, Industrial Revolution. Thanks, Neil. 
just checking. Um, our country was built around units of community. But since Descartes, who I think that was kind of 17th century, um, wrote the statement, cogito ergo sum, Paul Skip, uh, I'm picky on a teacher. Um, you're good at Latin, aren't you? What does cogito ergo sum mean? It means, I think, therefore I am. Or you can translate it in different ways. He didn't necessarily write those three words. It might have been different. It doesn't matter. Basically, since then, um, we've slid into an increasingly individualistic mindset. So now, rather than primarily defining our identity within the context of our family or maybe our village or maybe a guild that we work in or institutions or the church or the state, we've become more and more preoccupied with me, myself, I. And it's about my needs, my wants, my rights. And so you, you have things like iPhone, iPlayer, iPad, ITV, just joking. Um, <laughs> the cultural narrative has become, you can define yourself. That's what society's saying. You, you define who you are. You choose who you are, and your priority is number one, you do you. And the only caveat to that is, as long as you don't harm anyone else. But you can be and do whatever you want. Now, that's very appealing in many ways, isn't it? There's a lot of freedom in there. And for, for anyone who's ever lived under any kind of oppression, that's actually really liberating. But ultimately, is individualism just pandering to our own selfish, sinful selves? And what about our responsibility to one another, to other people? So I'm not, of course, talking about having no sense of self. Yeah, we're, we're made in God's image. We each have our own identities, but we're made to exist within relationship to God and to one another. Wasn't mixed word, picture of stones, just amazing. I almost felt like, oh, I don't need to speak. We can just ponder on, on that picture. We're made to exist within relationship to God and to one another. And that means we, we don't always prioritize me and my needs above those of others. And when we look at God in whose image we're made, what do we see? We see a relational being who is defined by love. So let's dive into God's word. Um, if you've got your Bible, uh, look at 1 John chapter 4. The verses are up here as well. Uh, verse 10, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then jumping to verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God is in them. Aren't those just beautiful verses that highlight the persons of the Trinity who are defined by love? And then we see how we can be drawn into that community of love through faith in Christ. And in that community, in that communion with God and with one another, we can become part of a body, a family, a team. Our good friend, John Groves, you know John, with no hair? I call him Yoda. I don't call him Yoda to his face, but he's kind of very wise and godly. Um, he's really helped us as a church. He puts it like this. Although team is not a biblical word, it represents a biblical concept. 
just like the word Trinity does. You could say that the whole of creation is headed by a team, Team Trinity. I can't imagine John writing that, but it's there. It's in his book, so he did write it. God is one being but three persons. The three persons of the Godhead work together in perfect harmony on a shared purpose and fulfilling complementary roles. It is how an ideal team should operate. And then the Apostle Paul unpacks this idea further in his letters to Rome and Corinth. In chapter 12 of both those New Testament letters, he describes the church as a body. So let's just quickly look at Romans 12. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So can you see the contrast that I've set up? Individualism says, me, me, me. Not really bothered about the rest of you. Not sure what you're up to. It's all about me. And um, the church, being a body, a team, says, I need you and you need me. Andy couldn't lead the way that he leads without the team around him. I couldn't perform the function that I perform on the team of this church without the rest of the team. And we wouldn't want to do it that way, would we? Can you imagine the car crash of any one of us doing it on our own? It would be awful. We, we're friends. We love serving in team together. I, wouldn't, I, I, feel, I feel genuinely sorry for anyone that has to do church on their own, lead on their own, not have team, not be part of something else with people who are different, who bring that flavor and richness to life. We're a team of friends, brothers and sisters in the family of God, and we help one another. Paul brings Similar teaching in 1 Corinthians 12, which we're not, we're not going to read it all, but in verse 14, he says, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. In verse 15, he's explaining a foot is still part of the body, even though it's different from a hand. He goes on in verse 16, saying, it, basically, if we were all the same, then we would be deficient. Like if the whole body was an eye, we'd have no sense of hearing. He writes in verse 21, no part can say to the others, I don't need you. And then let's, let's read from verse 24. God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, Every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is part of it. That is the essence of mixed picture that he brought. Each one of you. Isn't that beautiful? You're allowed to agree with me. Oh, thanks. We each have a place. We each belong. Not one of us is superfluous. It's not like, oh, well, it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really matter. It wouldn't really matter whether Julie was here or not. Because the, no, it matters. It matters that Matt Dunstan's here. Yeah? It matters. It matters. And there's no hierarchy in, in those verses. There's no division. There's unity and identification. If one part suffers, we all suffer. If something goes really well for one part of the body, we all rejoice. If one site or ministry are having a hard time, I'm not indifferent to that. I'm stirred to action. I can pray. I can offer help. 
We, we should have that sense of togetherness, concern for one another, and ownership. If I see something that's going wrong, I don't ignore it and just think, oh, well, it's someone else's problem. I do something about it. I take responsibility. And in the body, there's no part that is more important than the rest. In sport and in life more generally, there is an obsession with star players. You know, who's the best? Is it, well, that's probably been decided, hasn't it? Messi or Ronaldo, no competition. Um, but that can creep into the church as well. We can, oh, you know, who's speaking that week? Who's leading worship? Oh, oh, it's them. Oh, that's not so good. We, we just do it unwittingly. We, we rate everything. But that's not, that's not the picture that Paul is painting. And we've seen how the cult of personality has been exposed in the last few years with tragic scandals of prominent Christian leaders around the world falling into sin or being abusive towards people. We know that the only one we build on and build around is Jesus, isn't it? You know that, don't you? Give me a confident yes. We're not building it around a certain leader or a certain style or a certain personality. We're building it around Jesus. And so we don't elevate leaders. We don't have some pedestal that we put Andy on. We kind of wheel him in and, and, he, and he sits on his throne or his elder's chair or something like that. We don't, that's not how we do it. We rightly do that with Jesus. We put Jesus on a pedestal. But with leaders, we love them, we pray for them, we support them, knowing that they're like us. They're like you and I. They have their ups and downs, strengths and weaknesses, gifts and vulnerabilities. They're probably desiring to become more mature like you and be more like Jesus, but they're also fallible and they get things wrong. Now, uh, if you're into sport, some of the best sports teams don't necessarily have all the best players on paper, do they? So I'm not, I'm not into it, but some of, you, some of you do fantasy NFL. No, clearly no one in this room. Or you do fantasy football, and you try and get the best players in your team. Um, but actually, the best working teams often don't have all of the very, very best players. What do they have? Of course, they're talented as individuals, but they have a commitment to one another. They have some kind of common purpose or goal that they're working towards, and they have a camaraderie, like a togetherness, that makes them truly a team. They're, they're, they're friends. They love one another. And with the teams that I get to serve in, whether it's the eldership team or the staff team or other teams that I get to serve in, in this church, I would say people are genuinely my friends. In fact, some of my best friends in the world I get to be in a team with. Isn't that fantastic? And our culture around us, our society, yearns for that kind of friendship and camaraderie and companionship. You, sh you see it in our kind of shared stories. Think, think of movie series so often based around a diverse group of people that end up working together and collaborating. Think about, you know, I, I'll use my usual cultural references. Fellowship of the Ring, the fellowship. There's hobbits and elves and dwarves. Um, or Star Wars, you know, you, you know, even reluctant rebels. I won't go on to Star Trek, but you, you, know, you know, it's, can you see, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a disparate group of people that work together, and they may not like each other initially, but they grow to love one another because they've been thrown together. Do you realize what we have that's what we have in the church. We have that kind of companionship. 
Jesus has made it possible for there to be no divisions. So all the things that divide people around the world, and you can think of so many things, rich, poor, different cultures, class, background, all the things that bring division, politics, Jesus makes a way for there to be no divisions between us. Through his death and resurrection, we're reconciled to him, but we're reconciled to one another, as it says in Ephesians 2. So how this looks practically is that we believe in team at every level of church life. We have team leadership. We have a plurality, a team of elders. It's not just about one leader, like a CEO or president. Jesus warns against leaders that lord it over others. Leaders serve. And we believe in teams of people serving together, not working alone, but working together. Now, the concept of team comes from oxen harnessed together. I couldn't find a very good photo. That's the best I could find. They all looked a bit cruel to me around the neck. But anyway, um, I think we should act this out. Andy, come on. Come and be oxen with me. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're held together by this wooden yoke laid across uh, their shoulders. And the purpose was to share the load. You know, if we, if we scrum down, arm over my shoulder. You know, we, we share the load, don't we? Um, it, no, no. Um, are you saying that I don't pull my weight? No, I'm saying that. <laughs> I'm saying I pull a lot of um, and then Kat. Kat, can you come and help us? You can leave the camera. Oh, we're probably... Yeah, come on, lock in. My sporty friend. Okay, so the point why Kat's here, Kat is representing Jesus, because she's more like Jesus than I am. Um, if, if it's just Andy and I, that's fine. We share a load. But that's not what's happening. We are yoked together with Jesus. Yeah? So we, we share, he shares our load and we share his load. But where, where Jesus goes, if he wants to go off in that direction, we go. Yeah? And, and if Jesus wants us to go this way, we go. Yeah? I, we can stop now. That's probably enough embarrassment for you both. Thank you. Wonderful demonstration. So we're not, we're not just yoked together. It's not just like, well, we're Christians, we know Jesus, and we'll work it out together. We're yoked together with him. That is incredible. Everything that we're doing, he's with us in it. He's sharing it. He's carrying it. There may be things that are feeling like they're too much for you at the moment. Jesus is carrying it with you. He is sharing your burden. And in terms of being a united team, following Jesus, I just want us to think very quickly about one particular expression of that. There are so many outworkings, okay? But let's just, let's just pick one expression. Let's consider about who gets the glory or the credit or the honor. All through the Gospels, we see Jesus honoring his Father. He gives glory to the Father. It's like he's taking any, any glory that might be put onto him, he, he shifts it onto his Father. Now, for us in teams, we tend to seek glory for ourselves, don't we? we um, this is probably just me. I know you're all more holy than I am. But, and we tend to deflect what makes us look bad. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, good stuff. Ah. Oh. You know, we enjoy our moment in the spotlight of glory, okay? And bad stuff, oh, quickly, the mirror, the mirror comes up and it's like, oh, I'll deflect that onto Sam. Sam, Sam can take the blame uh, for that one. Jesus models the opposite. He models a completely different way. When things go well, it's almost like we should deflect the glory onto others. It's like... Oh, Neil, actually, Neil did that. That was great. Or, oh, actually, that thing that went really well, actually, Julia did all the work. And so, and so we reflect 
honor and praise and credit onto other others. And most of all, we reflect glory onto God. We don't say, oh yeah, aren't we great? Look how many people we've got here. Look at what we've built. Aren't we? Woohoo! It's like, no, we know. We didn't make it happen. But look at what God's done. We give him glory. That's part of how we follow Jesus and really embody what it means to be team. So in summary, in the church, there's no pecking order because we're the priesthood of all believers. It's not like, oh, well, there's the priests at the front and they're the important ones. God's word says we're all priests in God's family. There's no favorites. There's no star players. We're all valuable and we need each other to be the people that God has called us to be. So you're not like the kid at school waiting, hoping to be picked for the sports team. Pick me, pick me. Yeah. Again, mix picture. You have been chosen. He has selected you. There's no doubt you're on the team. And I want to encourage us, let's have more of a team mentality. The Christian life is a team sport. It's not like a solo sport where you just compete on your own and you compete against rivals and you compare yourself and think who is better. You're part of a team. Your teammates need your encouragement and your support, and you need them. So we should all be thinking about, how can I help the people around me? What, what do they need? How can I help them do stuff better? How can I encourage them? And our response to this value of team should be to think more about us rather than only about me. So here's, here's just some for instances to finish. Think about how will this benefit us rather than how will this benefit me? Or think about how will this affect us? Maybe it's a big decision that we're going to make. How will this affect us rather than just how will it affect me? Because otherwise the danger is, well, this works great for me. It's not so great for, for those 50 other people. Or what about this? First ask, how does this make us look rather than how does this make me look? Or think, how can we do it rather than how can I do it? Trust me, it will save you a lot of stress, anxiety, and pressure if you start to think more about us rather than just you. I'm not saying uh, ignore your own feelings, and only think about other people, that can be dangerous as well. I'm simply saying that I think it's more natural and we mostly have a tendency to think first of ourselves and our own priorities and to neglect the impact on other people. And I'm saying in that context of this more individualistic mindset, let's think more about our community, more about us than just myself. I believe God is calling us as the church to show a different way to the world. Will you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters here with me. I thank you just like that picture that Mick shared. I thank you that each of us is precious. Each one of us has been chosen and selected and shaped and we are being built together like living stones as the place where you dwell. And I pray for anyone who is feeling uh, overlooked or ignored or on the outside or that there is division or conflict or pain in their lives. I pray, Holy Spirit, in this time now, would you come and minister your love to them? Come, Holy Spirit, and do what only you can do. Beyond the words that I've been able to say, Holy Spirit, would you do something in our hearts that would bring this change of mindset? 
to us, to family, to the body, to the team, that we're not alone, that we're in it together with one another and with you. Lord, I pray against any kind of uh, stronghold of rejection or hurt for people that maybe have been kind of cast out by their family or have been really badly let down by someone. Lord, would you minister your love? And I pray in this context of the church, of the family of God, of brothers and sisters, friends together, loved by God, I pray that we would become whole in you, Lord, that we would find who we really are in you. We ask that in your name, Lord. Amen.